Here's what I want to do today. I remember uh, early on in my youth ministry, I always had high school students asking me, how do I know if I'm really saved? Um, And what they're saying is generally, how do I know that I'm not going to hell? If I can just kind of reinterpret, that's really what they're asking me. Because there's, there's something about a high school student, somewhere between like 8th and 12th grade, where they start to actually realize you can die. And I think that there's something about sitting down with them then and, and answering that question for them. Let me, let me tell you how you can know that you're going to spend an eternity with Jesus Christ. Now, what we've made it in the past is, is we've made it a prayer. Well, did you say the prayer? Well, what's the prayer? I mean, is that thing that I remember my mom told me, yeah, you said the prayer when you were four. <laughs> okay. I don't remember what I did when I was four. Now, I'm not saying a kid can't be saved at four. I'm just telling you, that nowhere in the Bible does it say a prayer saves me. I think it still comes back to, for God so loved the world that whosoever, what, believes in Him will not perish. It's not a prayer. It's, it's, it's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves to get to God, not as a result of works. But then interestingly, James is going to come in and connect and say, I'm going to give you a gift. I'm going to tell you how you know that you're saved. And what he's going to connect it to, and we're going to really start to teach on, is that those that have true faith will have true works. See, true faith, it's kind of like, I don't know, uh, I used to, now that I have kids, I'm scared my sister's going to get me back. But I always used to buy her kids the loudest possible toy I could. (laughs) Because I knew I only had to put up for it for about three or four days, and then I got to leave. But this toy, you know that that loud toy, the only way it works is if I shove the battery in it. I can sit there all I want and go, hey, look at the toy, it's real fun, woo! But until I put the battery in, it starts going, woo, hee, woo, boop, boop, you know, then all of a sudden I know this toy has what it takes to operate. See, what true faith is, is that we have this life and literally God interjects us with this faith that brings us to life. In other words, they're not my works because Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, I was created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that I would walk in them. I want to know, I want everybody in here to know this. And I know sometimes I can come across as like excited and, and man, people think I'm like mean or something. I'm not a mean guy. It's just... I'm the type of person, my, my wife makes spaghetti, and I'm like, oh, baby, this spaghetti is so awesome. It's meatballs and the tomato sauce, and you used penne today. Oh, that's just who I am. I'm an excitable person. And so just so you know, the one, and somebody comes up and goes, man, you always look mean, and so I'm going to try to smile today. Um, I'm still going to get excited, though. I just, I, it's, the thing about it is, is I believe in this. I believe literally that this book tells every person in here, you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He can know you, you can know him, and he can come into your life, and he can change your life, and he can make it different. And then, oh, by the way, there's this really cool side benefit called heaven, spending eternity with him. Because James, it's really cool in James 1, 19, and we're gonna, that's where we're going to be today, he, he calls these people my beloved brethren. And so when somebody came up to me and they said, Todd, you look mean, I was like, okay, I better go examine my own heart. So again, see this beautiful smile. But all through the book of James, he says this constantly. He says, my beloved brethren, my beloved brothers, my brothers, my brothers. And let me just tell you something. As I stand in front of you today and with a clean conscience, I spent all week begging God for me to have a heart across to each and every one of you. And I'm from Wyoming, and I don't say this very well, and I probably should say it more, but I honestly can say I love you guys. I, I can honestly say that when I stand up here today, and I know I get excited, and, and I'll try to keep myself under control, I guess, but I just believe in this. And my biggest fear, and especially being a youth pastor, is as I, I knew kids made decisions for Christ, but they made generally, it was kind of like, you know the soils in the New Testament? Jesus talks about there was one soil that had weeds, one that was on a path, one that was rocky soil. And it sprung up a couple of them. They looked like they were saved, but it said they died. And I don't want to tell anybody, you have a faith. I want to say, by faith you're saved, but it better be a faith that changes your life. In other words, if you're somebody sitting here today that says you have faith and you don't have works... James later on in 2.14 through 26 is going to say that faith is dead. It doesn't exist. 
And so as I stand here today, what we're going to talk about, last week I wanted everybody to know God is big. God is huge. And he came and he lived and he created stars and he was gigantic and he came into our life and he changed us. He made us the first fruit and that was the point of the mirror to make us different. He puts us on display. But here's the second thing I want to talk about today. See, everything is about how do I know I'm saved? In James 1, 2 through 12, the whole idea is, is that I, I do well in my trials. In James 1, 13 through 18, I do well with my temptations. God is big. But here's today. Do you believe the Bible is big? Do you honestly believe this book that was given to us is big? Now, we know that, and, and, and all of us go through the ebbs and flows. I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I'm in the Old Testament... And I get to the hole, and so and so begat so and so, and so and so begat so and so. I'm like, dang, begat them already. You know, let's get on. <laughs> but part of it is, is because I don't understand what God is trying to tell me there. See, the incredible story of all those begat, 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 begat is it all stems, they're all telling who's the father of so and so, who's the father of so and so, who happens to be the father of this amazing person, Jesus Christ. They want you to know the line and where it came from. God felt it was so important to understand this, but for the longest time, I was just like, yeah, begat, 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 begat. Anyway, boof, and I get where I need to go. But I hear people say all the time, I'm kind of bored with the Bible. And what I want to do today is I want to try to help every single one of us in here not be bored with the Bible. I really believe this book is living and it's active in in Hebrews 4.12, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to penetrate into parts of our life that we can't imagine. The problem is, is we tend to treat it like it's not as a sword. We try to treat it like it's a shovel or something else. It's used for one purpose, and that's to come into our life and to change us and to make us different. Now, let me start off by saying this. If you're somebody that does not believe in Jesus Christ, this book will never be anything but boring. All right? In other words, you have to have a faith in Jesus Christ. You have to understand that the God that's talked about in this book is the God that everything stems around and comes around. This is the book that tells me about it. But then there's two other things that I think it's outlined. Verses 19 through 21, if you're someone that takes notes, 19 through 21 is going to talk about the fact that not only do I have to be a believer, but I have to actually then receive this book. I have to receive it. I have to take it in. I've got to find some way in my life to ingest it into me, to make it a part of me. And then the second part of it he's going to talk about when he gets down to 22 through 27 is this idea, then I have to actually do it. See, the problem is with most people is that I also find people just kind of read it and they're like, uh-huh, ba 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 da 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 Then they go off to their checklist and it's like, good, I read the Bible today, aren't I great? I mean, that's just, we kind of just go through the motions. And it's kind of, I used to sell tennis rackets. I don't know a clue about tennis. All I knew is at the time when I was in college, I thought the girls that played tennis were hot. That's all I knew. And so I go to work at this store and they hand me, you know, they try to teach me how to do rackets. So I'm reading all the Wilson material and the Prince material and all this stuff. And I'm learning about rackets. I learned about flex. You know, this is a 6.1. What Von Lendl uses this one. And this is what it's for. And if I string it at 72.3 you know, pounds, this is what's going to happen. And I'm like, and people are like, wow you must be a great tennis player. As far as you know, anyways. I mean, it's just that thing. Now, if they ever said to me, hey, let's go play tennis, I would have been like, uh, uh, how do you hold it? You know, I mean, I I don't even, I didn't know how to hold a racket. Now, finally, I learned how to play with my wife and after getting beat by her enough times, I quit playing. But it's this thing in which I think a lot of people, they know the Bible, like like I did tennis rackets, but they don't know how to do the Bible. And when I don't know how to do the Bible, it gets very boring. And so that's what I also think. So we're going to talk about that. That's where we're going to go today. Now, I'm going to be very, very honest with you. I am going to come across to some of you as boring today. And I'm going to do that on purpose. The main reason is, is that my biggest fear is you've got a, a church that has phenomenal teachers in it. You've got a, a Francis Chan and a Chuck Bomar and some of these different people that can come up and teach you the Bible, that can do illustrations and everybody loves them and they're funny. And, and, and my, my fear is, is that somehow in the middle of it we forget that it's not about funny guys or about illustrations or about all that stuff. It's about this book. And so here's what I'm going to ask you today. For the next about 30 minutes, I want you to focus. And we're going to dive into this book, and I'm going to try to show you that if you will make this thing a part of your life, you will never be the same person ever again. 
It will radically change you and adjust you. And I'm not going to use lights today and I'm not going to use hats with naked Barbie dolls and I'm not going to do those things. Come back next week, you never know what's going to happen. Francis will be here. But today, all I want to do is I want to grab a Bible and I want to open it up with you and I want to show you how you can absolutely fall in love with God's Word. Okay, so I, that's my, I'm giving you the, uh, that's kind of like the warning on the front of the label. Uh, this is explicit lyrics or whatever it is. I'm about ready to just, I'm going to be to some of you born, but let's dive into Scripture. Look at verse 19. This you know, and he's, this you know points back to verse 18 in this concept that you know God's Word changed you. In other words, I know that God's Word changed Paul because suddenly he was no longer asking his wife to smoke weed. He was asking his wife to sit down and open the Bible with him. All right? In other words, this book has changed you. My beloved brethren, those that I love. And then he says this. If you're going to fall in love with the Bible, you have got to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, why does he write that? Well, if you think about it, to be quick to hear, to be slow to speak, it's an attitude. It's an attitude that in the United States we don't have very well. In fact, I would say in the United States we're opposite. We are slow to listen and quick to speak. Now, how do I know that? Because I'm one of you. And every week, my wife and I, when we get into a discussion, I'm that person, I hate myself for this, I'm that person that you're talking to me and I'm, on the inside I'm going, uh-huh, 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 and I'm just waiting to talk. And I don't really care what you're saying to me, but I'm just sitting there waiting to talk back at you because somehow in my arrogance and pride, I think what I have to say is more important than you. Now, how do I know that? This week I tried to watch uh, talk shows. Holy cow. Everybody thinks unless I talk, we wasted our time. Now, there's a proverb that's told way back when, and this is what this guy says. He said, have you ever noticed that your ears are always open and that there's two of them? Have you always noticed that your mouth, which is only one, is shut with lips around it and teeth to guard it? See, the thing about it is, is I don't think we spend enough time, and I'm going to say this now again, I'm going to say this in love. I think it would do us well to shut up and listen, wouldn't it? Like, I was thinking about it. If I actually listened to my wife, how many fights I could cut down on. Now, we only fight maybe once a year. Kidding. Kidding. But I wouldn't get into arguments with my wife. If I actually listened, which I don't do very well, I wouldn't get myself in the trouble I am. And also, if I didn't talk so much, the proverb says, even a fool who closes his mouth seems wise. Right? And in order to hear Scripture, in order to hear me today, and that's why I believe in preaching, because this is the one time everybody comes in and just shuts up and only one person says, let's open our Bibles. And everybody just kind of sits there and goes, okay, I'm listening. Because the rest of the time, we generally aren't. We're flying around. And then he he follows it up with this. He says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, what I want to do is is make these opposite. Instead of saying quick to hear, slow to hear. And instead of saying slow to speak, quick to speak. And look what happens. Be slow to hear, quick to speak. And I would say then the only other response would be then is that I become quick to anger right? People are angry because they are slow to listen and quick to speak. Everybody is. Everybody gets angry because this is who we are. And then he follows it up with this. He says, this is your attitude. You need to have this attitude of shutting your mouth because if you don't shut your mouth, the anger of man will never achieve the righteousness that God desires. Now, what does that mean? What happens is, is that as I shut my mouth and open my ears, something amazing starts to happen in my attitude. See, this book, according to the book of John 15, it says, when it comes into me, it starts to become a part of me. And when it becomes a part of me, it begins to change me. And how do I know that that these things change? Have you ever hung around high school students? High school students I love. It's a group of people I love more than anyone. But have you ever known, I can put them in a group of students and they will become like them like that. In other words, suddenly if I put a high school student with a bunch of uh, people that love to wear black and black makeup and black this and black that... Um, trust me, I've seen a kid that was like a total jock all-star all of a sudden sitting there wondering, singing songs about killing himself. Um, in other words, I can get, they pretty soon I can hang around people, even myself, and I start to pull on their lingo. Have you, have you ever noticed that about yourself? You start to tell the same jokes, you start to do the same things. Literally, I can tell who a person is, 
I, I can tell who a person hangs out with by listening to them. Now, our problem is, is do we hang out with God? See, what he's talking about is, is the righteousness God desires is the only righteousness that comes from actually being with him. See, whoever you're around the most will begin to affect you and begin to change you and to begin to make you like it. Look at verse 27. Look at the very end. He says to keep yourself unstained by the world. It's that thing that when I watch TV, I guarantee you, if I said to a group of us in here, what is the commercial about man law? There's some of you in here that know what beer that is. And don't pretend like you don't. If I, and I could, you deserve a, what? Break? When? Today. Right? I mean, it's all these things that literally, whatever we begin to absorb into us and think about and become a part of, we begin to be like it. And so James is coming in and he's going to say, look, the reason that you need to shut your mouth and begin to be like this is because the more you're in this, the more you become like it. And the less that I'm around this, guess what? The more I become stained by the world. It just is going to happen. Um, I always see it, I can tell as I work with different people, the kind, of, with the kind of person they're around, if they're around people that are kind of lethargic, don't care about anything, they don't care about anything. But I've also seen people, man, when they're around that group of people that's going crazy and trying to pursue something, that's what they do. And then he's going to show us something different in verse 21. He says, and he's going to answer this question, okay, so how do I begin to do this? He says, look, put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and in humility receive the word of God implanted, which is able to save your souls. Now, whenever I come to the word therefore, I need to ask the question, what is the therefore? Therefore, okay? It's therefore because he just said, look, I want to achieve this righteousness of God. I want God to accept me. And so he says, look, here's the first thing you need to do. You need to put aside all filthiness. Now, here's what he's talking about. Last night, I was sitting there holding one of the foster kids we have, and I'm sitting there bouncing him. And as I'm bouncing him, all of a sudden my wife says those scary words to me. I just fed him. (laughs) And all down the front of him, it was soiled. Now, I could have left him in that, but I knew in order to get the kid unsoiled, I had to take the kid in, I had to take off his clothes, and in taking off his clothes, I began to take that off of him. Now, this filthiness, is, it literally is speaking of the way in which the world infects us. That means every day when I come home, can I just give you an exercise that I've started to go through? I begin to take off my day. You know how just going through the day, we pick it up, don't we? I mean, we pick up things that we wish we would have never heard, never been around, never seen, never, all that stuff. And literally, I just, I end my day now because of this passage actually going, okay, God, help me to take off what happened today because I heard things and I saw things and I participated in things I should have never been in. In other words, I need to spend my day. If I'm going to be somebody that's going to receive the word, I have to take off all the stuff that's going to keep me from hearing the word. But not only that, but look at the next thing he says. Not only do I have to take off that, these dirty clothes, but all that remains of wickedness. Now what he's talking about there is, it's not just the stuff that's on me, but it's the stuff that's in me. You know like when you're lying in bed and nobody else knows that stuff about you but you? That stuff that just as you stare at the ceiling and you're all alone... And as you look up into the ceiling, there's just stuff about you that nobody else knows. God says, before you're going to ever hear my word, you've got to get rid of that too. What it is, is it's kind of like I grew up in Wyoming and I grew up on a farm that a farmer would take his tractor and he would pull a plow over the ground and his whole goal in pulling the plow over the ground was to begin to turn up the soil because before he put a seed in there, he knew the soil had to be turned up. And what it is in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Meaning, I've got to go to God that before I open up the Bible, before I ever know I'm going to hear it, and before I'm going to get excited about it, I've got to go to God and say, God, I'm dirty today. i got stuff on me. But God, it wasn't just their fault. i got stuff in me. And if I'm going to hear your word today, God, I want to come to you and say, please forgive me. And God begins to turn us over. And pretty soon he works it. And looks what he says. After I do that, he says, now in humility, receive the word implanted in your souls. 
See, by coming to God and saying, God, I actually need you, that's called humility. The reason I don't think I need God every... I mean, I demonstrate I don't need God. You know, I don't pray. I go, I can go almost a whole day sometimes without ever praying. And all of a sudden, I get to the end of my day and I just demonstrate to God by not praying, I don't really need you, God. He gives me the Bible. And by not reading it, you know what I'm saying to him? I don't need you. It's the humility to go, oh my gosh, God. I live in a world that's lost, that's dying, that's fallen apart. Unless I put myself into this, I'm not going to be a good parent. I'm not going to be a good employee. I'm not going to be a good husband or wife. I'm not going to be able to do it because I need you today. You're God, you're big, and I need to catch a vision of you that I don't see. And so, God, I need to take off all this stuff that's going to keep me from doing it. I need to root out the sin that's inside of my life because, please, I need to hear you because if I don't hear you, my day is going to become a mess. Help me. Help me, help me. And he turns us over. And the cool thing about it, he says, is as the word begins to go down to us, it says it implants itself. I love that. Do you know why they plant we, uh, different kinds of grass on the sides of hill? Because they know that those plants hold the hill back up against it. In other words, it holds the hill together in a lot of ways. In other words, this word, what it does is it begins to infect my life. It begins to change me and to make me different. But the thing he says is, is listen, you've got to receive it. Now, if you're somebody that doesn't spend time in the Bible, everything I just said makes no difference. The other thing is, is I've oftentimes found people saying, I don't have time for the Bible. I would respond to you, you don't have time not to have time for the Bible. You've got to get in this book. And the reason it's boring a lot of times is because we don't dive into it and get to know it. We'd much rather hear a sermon or we'd much rather read a book. I would say to you, Dive into this and receive it. That's the first thing. If you're going to find the Bible exciting, you actually have to read it. And doesn't that make sense? I mean, it's like, no, duh. If you're going to learn geometry, you have to go to geometry. If you're going to learn math, you've got to learn math. I mean, it's just like, okay, no, duh. Now look what else he says, though. Not only do I have to receive it, but look at verse 22. You have to prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Now, I love that. Now, here's what it's talking about. He's saying, look, if you're a true believer, not only do I have to hear it and take it in, but then I have to actually practice it. I've actually got to do it. Now, when I went to college a lot back in the day, there were certain classes I took, and there were certain classes I took I could either audit or I could actually take the class as a student. Now, the difference between auditing and the difference between being a student was I actually had to take tests. I actually had to read the material. I actually had to do it. The other one just sits there and goes. And I believe that the biggest problem in the church today is we have auditors and not students. We have a bunch of people that show up and just hear and they never do. See, the reason that the Bible gets boring is because we never do anything with it. I'll never forget, there was a guy named Pat McCoy. I, he, I was in Campus Crusade with him. And, and he said, look, Todd, you need to learn how to share your faith. And he taught me how to use what was called the four spiritual laws. And there's nothing special about it. But the opening statement in the four spiritual laws was, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And so I'm thinking, no problem, man. I take my four spiritual laws and I walk up to a guy and I'm like, hey, I was wondering if I could talk to you a little bit today. And he's like, sure. And I sit down and literally, when I started to sit down, I got so freaked out and scared. And I'm like, hey, man. You know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And he's like, not if it's that plan, man. And I walk him through and he's like, you know, there's two and a cross and you need to believe, man. See the circles? And there's these circles at the end and I'm like trying to, and I just know he's sitting there going, I'm never going to follow that dude. And I go back to Pat McCoy and I'm just like, dude, I was so scared. And he goes, you're all right. He goes, at least you did it. Because you know what, Todd? Next time you go back, you're going to know more and more and more and more what you need to do. And he opened up a Bible and he started to walk me through, Todd, here's how you can begin to implement this in the lives of people. See, I didn't know I was scared to share my faith until I actually had to what? Share my faith. I didn't know I could actually be a good husband until I sat down and read this amazing passage and said, Todd, love your wife like Christ loves the church. And I tell you what, I've got that in my head, but if you came to my house most days, 
I do not love my wife like Christ loves the church. So often. When all she says is, Todd, can you take out the trash? Yeah, baby. Right after the game. Huh, can I do it at halftime? Can I do it after the next game, baby? Huh, next day? I mean, it's just literally, I don't live it out. And the reason that I think most marriages are boring is because the Bible says, here's what marriage can be. But we never do it. And so marriage gets what? Boring. Have you ever read the book of Song of Solomon? Talk about the hottest, steamiest, just dying. I mean, it is just... Oh! If I started to treat my wife like Song of Solomon, she would feel like... She'd just be so excited that this is my husband. and She'd be thrilled about me being her husband. But instead, I think I'd treat my wife more like the book of Jude or something, you know, where it's like nothing. Shut up, woman! I mean, it's just this thing that literally, if I started to do that, to actually live out that, I would actually then have a wife that thrilled at honoring me and respecting me. See, guys come in, it's like, why doesn't my wife submit? And I want to look at him and go, because you're a loser. That's why. (laughs) And I say that with love, okay? Everybody knows this. See, smile? Okay. Because it's hard to be married. And I go in and I try to love my wife, and then what happens? You love her and you treat her well, and what does she do? Take up your socks, pick up your underwear. No, 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 no. No, but baby, baby, I love you. You got like a neck that's beautiful, honey. Song of Solomon, you got to read it. And then I learn that she doesn't always want to love me back. And I've got to then go, God, uh, what do I do? And I go back into the Bible, and it's like, oh i got to love my enemies. Oh, yeah, I do, God. Love that woman. (laughs) Enemy, I love you. Do it. Too many of us are auditing. That word deceive yourself is a pretty interesting word. The, The whole concept behind it, it means a miscalculation. The greatest miscalculation that so many believers make is is they miscalculate that somehow I'm just supposed to absorb the Word of God. That I'm supposed to just sit there and go... How many, how many, how many, how many? And it's just supposed to come into me and somehow something's supposed to happen. This book is given to us not to just hear it, book James says, but to do it, to live it. Now, this story I found is really cool. It's by a guy named Chuck Swindoll. And you're going to hear in just a second, it was written a long time ago. But let me just read it to you. Let's pretend that you work for me. In fact, that you are my executive assistant in a company that is growing rapidly. I'm the owner and I'm interested in expanding overseas and to pull this off I make plans to travel abroad and to stay there until the new branch office gets established. I make all the arrangements to take my family in the in the move to Europe for six to eight months and I leave you in charge of the busy stateside organization. I tell you that I will write you regularly and give you direction and instructions. I leave and you stay. Months pass. A flow of letters are mailed from Europe and received by you at the national headquarters. I spell out all my expectations and finally I return. Soon after my arrival, I drive down to the office and I'm stunned. Grass and weeds have grown up high. A few windows along the street are broken. I walk into the receptionist's room. She's doing her nails, chewing gum, and listening to her favorite disco station, a.k.a. it was written back maybe in the 70s. I look around and notice the waste baskets are overflowing. The carpet hasn't been vacuumed for a week and nobody seems concerned that the owner has returned. I ask about your whereabouts and someone in the crowded lounge area points down to the hall and yells, I think he's down there. Disturbed, I move in that direction and bump into you as you're finishing a chess game with our sales manager. I ask you to step into my office, which has been temporarily turned into a television room for watching afternoon soap operas. And I say, what in the world is going on, man? You look at me and say, what do you mean? Well, take a look at this place, I say. Don't you ever get any of my letters? Letters. Oh, oh, yeah, your letters. Yeah, sure, I got every one of them. As a matter of fact, we've had letter study every Friday night since you left. We've even divided all the personnel into small groups and discussed many of the things you've written. Some of those things were really interesting. You'll be pleased to know that a few of us have actually committed to memory some of your sentence and paragraphs. One or two memorized an entire letter or two. Great stuff in those letters, sir. Okay, okay, you got my letters, you studied them and meditated them and discussed them and even memorized them, but what did you do about them? Do? We didn't do anything. See, the thing we forget, these letters aren't here to just be absorbed. 
One of my biggest fears in the church is all of us that sit around and go, oh yeah, great stuff in the Bible. Great stuff. And we send our kids to places and they memorize it and we go, Hercules, Hercules, you know, way to go. Way to go. You're memorizing scripture. Good for you. When in the world are we going to look at our kids and go, what are you going to do about what you just said to me? Nice stuff. What are you going to do? See, the mistake, the reason the Bible is boring because we don't live it out. We don't actually try to make it work. We don't actually try to go out and live it. And so in other words, the reason I get bored with it is because I'm not doing it. I receive it. There's a lot of people receiving a lot of it. You all are sitting here today and you're hearing me talk about God's word. And the question I'm going to ask you, are you going to do anything about it? Because see, the other thing, look what he says here. Look at verse uh, 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person that he is. This idea that he's talking about here, this person that looks in this mirror is this. Back in the day, they used to have these mirrors that were either uh, bronze or they were a different kind of metal, uh, sometimes even silver, and the really rich people had gold mirrors. And what they would do is they would, they would put them out there and they would shine them to make them as, as bright as you could possibly get them. And what people would do is, is you would have to sit your mirror up and then you'd have to adjust it to get just the right light so that you could see yourself. And a lot of times what women did is they actually got mirrors that lied to them. It was like going to the house of mirrors, you know, that, that, at, the, at the carnival. You walk into that one, you know, you're feeling a little overweight until you walk to that one that makes you look tall and skinny and you're like... <laughs> Yeah, I like this mirror. Some kid tries to get into it and you're like, (laughs) See, what he's talking about is there's groups of people that will grab and he's going to talk about this being the Bible and they will situate the Bible in such a way by reading it until they look good and they like it. And then they sit down, it says, and and they read it and really because they haven't done anything with it, they go away and they immediately forgot what the person, what it was like. Who cares? In fact, I believe there's some people that use Scripture to explain away Scripture because they don't like a Scripture. A guy will walk into my office and say, hey, I'm leaving my wife. I'm going to divorce her. Oh, really? Why? Because I read a really cool verse in the Bible that says I can. Oh, really? (laughs) Really? Why don't you show me that verse? Well, I don't know. I think it's like in Second Hesitations or First Fleshalonians. I don't remember, but, you know, it's it's in there. (laughs) Trust me. Trust me, and they manipulate it to fit it. I'll read to them a passage, and they'll go, yeah, you could look at it that way, and then they grab it and do this. But, have you tried looking at it this way? No. Because look at this next one. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the one who dives into it, that looks at it, that gets himself into it, the one that grabs that mirror and says, I'm not going to twist it any other way till I see myself for who I am. And then he calls it the law of liberty, which the perfect law, the law of liberty, meaning this book that has been given to us by God not to confine us, but actually to free us, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. See that word abide, to remain? I'm the kind of person I love steak. I am a steak freak. Growing up in Wyoming where there's more cows than people, You learn to love beef. And there's nothing better than I like to do than to sit down with my steak. Because when I eat my steak, I eat it very slow. I love a T-bone. And you know how there's the two sides of the T-bone? The side that's like really soft and juicy. And the side on this one, thats it's still good, but it's not like this one. And I always eat this side first because I want my last bites to be this one. And I cut into my steak... And I cut it just into the right one, and I just chew on it. Hey, Dave, how you doing? I just chew on it. Dave's on the crazy cycle diet plan. And so I just eat that steak. I'm like, how am I doing? All right? And I eat it. Good? And so, and I just chew, and I enjoy every last bit of flavor that's coming off of it. And then I, oh, my baked potato. It's got the butter and the steam and the sour cream coming off of it. It's got the bacon. And I stir it up. And then I just slide it into my mouth and it just melts in there. And finally I make it to that good side of the T-bone and it just sits there and my, my knife touches it and it just cuts. 
and I put it in and I chew. Whole time I'm like this. <laughs> Loving it! That's what it means to abide. It's grabbing this book and treating it like I do a steak. See, everybody I know is trying to hurry through the Bible. I stopped doing that a long time ago. Some days I'll only read like five verses, and that's all right. Because I sit there, man, and I'm like, oh, God, I can't believe what you're giving me today. Oh, wow, 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 wow. And I chew and I chew and I chew. And why does it get exciting? Because I don't just leave it right away. I don't just walk away. See, the Bible says love one another. Think about that. Love one another. That in and of itself is like a, that's a, that's too much. I just need to start with love one un other. Love. I don't love. One. I don't love a one. And, and nothing. Other, no her either. I mean, it's just this thing where literally it's saying, look, love one another. Do I? And I take that into my heart and I just go, God, help me to love somebody. Help me to love them and care about them and care whether or not there's somebody actually sitting here today that may not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior that could spend an eternity in hell. Do I care that way? See, this word abide, the reason he says that is because then when I abide, I don't become a forgetful hearer. But instead, as I start to abide, the more I hang around it, I actually start to what? Do it. The more you think about it, have you ever noticed you do it? The reason that guys, when they look at pornography over and over and over and over again and then do something stupid is because they've looked at something over and over and over again and then it comes out. But if I begin to look at it, 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 and all of a sudden I go, oh my gosh, I'm actually starting to love people. I actually care about God. Why? Because I've spent time here being with it. And then look what he says. And that man will be blessed in what he does. You know what that means? You will love the Bible. In order to love the Bible, you have to be with the Bible. If you're a husband here, let me give you just a phenomenal insight. To love your wife, you need to be with your wife. To love your children, you actually need to be with your children, right? And in fact, I see too many people that love their children, love their children for years, and all of a sudden all their children are gone, and suddenly they have to reintroduce themselves at at that point to their husband or their wife. If you're going to love the Bible, you have to be in the Bible. But then he's going to go on a little bit further in verse 26. See, the biggest mistake we make is just to think, okay, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then he's going to give us three kind of dimensional issues that we're going to look at that says this is how you know if you're starting to live the Bible. Number one, verse 26 if you think yourself to be religious, in other words, if the, the, what you believe in begins to work its way out, that's all that word religious means, and yet you can't bridle your tongue, you deceive your heart and your religion is worthless. Check this out. On a given day, we will speak probably close to 18,000 words. 18,000. That means in a given month, you will speak 540,000 words which means in a given year, you will speak 6.4 million words. Did you know you spend a fifth of your life talking? And some of you, probably (laughs) two-fifths. But the thing about it is, eventually what he's saying to us is you will find out how well you do what you believe because your mouth is a tattletale on you. See, I love people that gossip. They always come up to me and say this. Hey, you know, I'm just concerned about this person, so I'd like to talk about him. <laughs> sure you do. <laughs> Have you talked to this person? Oh, no, no, that's why I'm talking to you first. Yeah, because you want to gossip. Because the Bible doesn't say, go to your local pastor and tattletale on the person. The Bible says, if your brother's in sin, you what? Go to them. I love women, man. I'll sit around some women, and they tattletale on their kid's sins. Oh, my kid, he's so bad. Loser. Loser. Sits on the couch, doesn't do anything, eats potato chips. What are we, the Holiday Inn? I mean, it's just this thing in which now we tattletale on our kids' sins. I hear husbands tattletale on their wives' sins. In other words, we love the gossip. But you know what? If we really love those people, we wouldn't put them in a bad light. In other words, it's this thing, do you control your tongue that way? Do you lie? 
Are you the type of person that, that when you go in to tell somebody about something, and I always see this with husbands and wives fighting, I always ask them the first thing, they come in and they're ready. You know they've got both barrels and they're about to unload on this person. It's like, Ch-ch-ch. and the first thing I ask them is I always say this, could you tell me the five best things about your spouse? No. Anyway, boom, you know, and they just start going. Why? Because they want to lie about their spouse because they want me to know how bad their spouse is. They lie. The other thing I've been thinking about is the way we slander people right to their face. I'm, this is my most grievous sin. I love to find weaknesses in others and exploit them. That's the problem with somebody that communicates a lot. We can look at different things and go, oh, wow, did you see your zit on your face? And then I start suddenly going from there and making this person feel awful. Why? Because I know if I make them feel bad, who feels better? Right here. I know when I'm not doing well in my faith with Christ because this nasty little thing in here, and look what he calls it. He says to bridle the tongue. You know why that is? It's because your tongue is a buck and bronco. Growing up in Wyoming, I learned what a buck and bronco is. It's a 1,500 to 1,800 pound piece of meat and a guy sits on it at a rodeo and he puts his hat down as far as he can and he looks up at the guy and goes, and then suddenly he lets him out. And that horse goes like this and literally what he's saying is you need to get a hold of that buck and bronco. Now the mistake we'll make is, is to try to grab it with ourselves and go, just shut your mouth so I don't say anything. But literally it comes back to the Bible. The Bible is what shuts my mouth. He's trying to let you know that the Word of God, reading it over and over, begins to take your mouth and go, like this. In verse 27, he says, Look, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress. What he's talking about, that word visit, in the United States, we are phenomenal on giving other people money to go care for the people that we don't want to touch. That word visit doesn't mean, hey, here's a check, good luck to you. That word visit means I am finding the lowest in our culture and I'm spending time with them. Actually, Francis is going to talk about this next week. This whole concept is James connecting together these thoughts and he's about to expand this idea right here. Do my hands actually touch what nobody else wants to touch? Am I with those people that nobody else wants to be around? Do I find them? The greatest blessing my wife and I have in our life right now is living this out and taking in foster kids. I believe those are the orphans of our culture. And let me tell you something. Tuesday, we're about ready to let one of our orphans go back to their parents. And it's breaking my heart. People come up and they say, it must be difficult. Yeah, no, duh. We pulled that kid out of the hospital and walked him through a drug problem. And yes, it is. And I'm not saying that to to please me. It's hard work to visit them in their, look at this word, distress. Their tribulation. It's the word plipsis, which means this idea that it's not easy to be there. But you will know if you're religious if, number one, you can control your tongue and if you actually have a heart for those that nobody else has a heart for. Now, before I go on, and I'm going to let Francis go ahead and have this one next week, but let me throw in my two cents. This one right here and the next one I'm about to talk about, I think are the greatest ills of the church today. We don't touch those that nobody else wants to touch. We tend to just touch the ones we want to touch. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Two weeks ago, I failed at this completely. And I'm going to confess to you. It was so weird. I said, I'm talking to this guy. And I love talking to people that make me laugh or that like to talk sports or like to talk because I get something from them. And I saw somebody coming in which I was going to have to give them something. It was going to cost me to be around them. And this is what I did. Lisa, please be there. I totally used this as a crutch to not have to talk to that person. I started studying this passage and I had to go to that guy and apologize to him. I said, I used my phone as a tool to totally not love you in your tribulation. And I said, I'm sorry. See, it's the small things that we do that find out, is my religion really there? And I had to go back to Scripture and Scripture said, yep, Todd, you're a loser. But it was okay because then God, but I love you anyways and hey, we're going to change you. That's the hope in this. But then he goes on to this. And he says, keep yourself unstained by the world. The concept is spotted. How? I don't have a clue how to keep ourselves unspotted. I've thought about this, and I don't even know how to tell you how to keep yourself unspotted. I've thought through this and thought through this. We live in a world that spots us. And all I can tell you is, this cleans you. We're going to get spotted. 
See, the mistake we make is that we forget that we need to be in the world, but what? Not of the world. In other words, I've got to get out there. I've got to get dirty. I've got to let these things... But I've got to then come home at night and go back to what he talked about and I need to every day put aside the filthiness and the evil that's a part of me because I will never hear the word of God unless it's there. Now, I know today I probably haven't been the most thrilling person in the world. I didn't use lights. I didn't use a hat with a naked Barbie hanging on it. Now, here's why. Because I believe this book is enough. One of the biggest mistakes, and trust me, we're going to still use illustrations and we're going to still, I mean, Francis can't not be funny. It's like in his DNA. But the thing about it is, with this book, I don't want you to fall in love with me. I don't want you to fall in love with Francis. I don't want you to fall in love with Chuck Bomar. I don't want you to fall in love with anybody else that speaks up here. I want you to fall in love with this. The reason that we teach this book is because I believe that if you ever in your own life decide to grab this book, you're going to be shocked. See, can you imagine this week, you husbands, you actually open up the book of Ephesians 5 and it says, love your wife like Christ loves the church. And you show up and your wife wakes up in the morning and you're like, oh, honey, I just made you breakfast in bed. And she's going to say, what were you smoking this morning? (laughs) And not only that, honey, but while, you know, I got up early, spent some time with the Lord and I cleaned the kitchen and I, you know, fed the baby and I took the dog for a walk and you know what? In fact, I'm going to take today off just to be with you. (laughs) Are you sick? What's going on with you? Can you imagine if you're a wife and actually walked in to your husband and just said, Hey, big boy, you're a big hunk, a hunk of man. (laughs) Love that spare tire you put on over the last 20 years. (laughs) Can you imagine as a parent if you didn't drive your kids up the wall? Suddenly your kid comes home and they just did the dumbest thing and you know you should just totally get on them. And you look at them and go, heard you had a bad day. I love you. Now let's talk about how in the world we're going to help you to have a better day tomorrow. Can you imagine if you were a kid and you actually obeyed your parents this week? First of all, your parents would freak out. (laughs) Hi, mother! Just wanted you to know I made my bed, cleaned my room. Whatever you say to do today, I'll do. Your mom would just go, Poof. Can you imagine if he showed up at work as a boss and found the guy that was the lowest person on the totem pole, showed up in his office and just said, You know what, how are you doing today? You know, I know I'm going a million miles an hour keeping this business running, but you know what, I remembered as a Christian I'm supposed to care about every single one of my employees. And so I'm just sitting down with you right now today to let you know I really want to know what's going on in your life because you matter to me because God has put you in my business. Can you imagine if you were an employee and actually you did your work hardly as under the Lord, not because you get a paycheck, but because your boss is God, actually. And your boss is like wondering why in the world you're actually working hard instead of playing solitaire on your computer. See, this whole doing it really matters. It really does things, actually. And as I do it, all of a sudden I realize it is hard and I start to realize the more that I try to live Scripture, I need more of it. I need prayer and I need God's people around me because this is the most simple book in the world but yet the hardest book in the world to live out. It is brutally hard. Love your wife like Christ loves the church. Oh, sure, no problem. Died for her today, twice. Let me tell you. No, you didn't. It's hard. And that means I need the Bible and I need my my relationship with God. I'm going to pray and we're about ready to sing. Now listen to me. This is what the Bible says. When we sing, it says lift your hands. Now I'm not telling you you have to. You might be one of those people that lifts your hands like this. You might be one of those people that just has really bad underarm stuff and that's cool. Please worship like this. It's okay. You might worship your, you might lift your hands in your heart. I don't care how it is. But actually the Bible says when you enter in, lift your hands with praise. It says to shout to the Lord. Can you imagine if you're doing your quiet time this week and you come across, shout to the Lord, and you're like five o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden you go, Woo! And your whole family just like, Woof. <laughs> Sorry family, just living out the word. Just living it out. 
being a doer of the word, if you know what I'm saying. But do it. But we're about to sing. It says, enter his courts with thanksgiving. Command. It says, when you come to the Lord, lift your voice high, it says. In other words, we might, I think the first song we sing is a little more mellow, right? If I remember right. So you know what? Enter reverentially. But I think the next one, we actually can clap. Like some of you, I don't know if you've got like problems with your hands or whatever. You don't have to clap, but it says clap. It says shout. It says do all these things. I mean, can you imagine if we actually showed up and lived biblical Christianity and got excited about being on life, in life? People might actually think we actually believe what we're doing here. And so we're about ready to practice the Bible right now. Now again, I'm not saying you have to raise your hands. You don't have to raise your hands. I'm not saying you have to clap. I'm just saying whatever it takes, do it exuberantly and do it like you mean it so that we can tell God, God, we are not going to be just hearers. We're going to do it. Amen? Let's stand up and let's pray. Jesus, we love you. God, forgive me for the times that uh, I talk more than I speak or I think way more than I listen. God, help us today to sing joyfully to the Lord. God, thanks so much for uh, your word. Make us different. In your precious name we pray. Amen.